Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very much a consumer of this literature and not a producer, and this is how I'm going to uh, organize my thought. The, these, are, these are two difficult papers to, uh, to discuss, uh, at least in 15 minutes, and I don't, th I don't think I'm going to, give to be given more. The, the, the paper by Barry is, uh, is, is a set of thoughts. Uh, it's partly a survey, it's partly caveats, it's partly warnings. In fact, it is largely based on 500 pages, uh, which is the book uh, what he wrote, which is called Hall of Mirrors, which is a comparison of a Great Depression and a Great Recession. And I uh, really strongly advise anybody in the audience uh, to read it. It's a fascinating reading, but it's not easy to discuss uh, in a few minutes. The, the paper by Ben, uh, as you saw, has two parts. The first one is that it's a very useful survey. And, and, and again, with the addenda that he has indicated exists, uh, it's a marvelous source of, uh, of, of, uh, of empirical evidence for on various uh, aspects of the, of the crisis. Uh, and then there is a beginning of empirical work on, on the real effects of financial crisis, which is very suggestive, but uh, doesn't, I don't exactly know how to, uh, to push it further at this point. So uh, I thought that what I would do is, based on, on both papers, uh, what they tell us about the uh, Great Depression, both in the U.S. and in Europe, and the Great Recession, both in the U.S. and in Europe, I would try to give a picture that I get of, of, a, of the different elements of a financial crisis, and because I'm a macroeconomist, focusing on, on the macroeconomic effects. So what I did, it's partly trivial, partly pedagogical, maybe partly wrong, um, which is to think of a five-level scale for financial crisis, going from mild, run-of-the-mill to acute, and then think about how each of these four episodes, in a way, I mean, the Great Depression in the U.S. is not the same as in Europe, and the Great Recession in the U.S. is not the same as that in Europe. Think about the similarities and the, the differences between the, the four crises, which seems to be what I, what I could do uh, potentially usefully. So I'm going to start with uh, what feels like a detour, but I don't think it is, and I think it will be useful uh, when, uh, when I go to the next slides, which is that much of this literature, either formal or informal, basically argues that financial crises lead to large multipliers, that small shocks and they have big effects, and then some of the literature points to multiple equilibria. And what I want to argue is that we are really part of the same family. Uh, it's just a matter of degree, and I want to, to do this by basically plotting the uh, interaction between some financial variable, I've used bankruptcies here, and some real variable, macro variable output in this case. So these are the, the two way relations uh, between the two. So if you basically start with the first graph, the locus like this gives you the reaction of output to bankruptcies. And you start at the beginning, you've had just a few bankruptcies, then the effect on output is small, but as bankruptcies become more and more uh, important, then the effect on output uh, is stronger and stronger, and therefore the, uh, the, 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 the reaction function is, is concave. Uh, the other way, if you start with uh, output and you look at the effect on bankruptcies, which is this line, uh, a few bankruptcies is not a big deal, but when you start getting you know, chains of bankruptcies, then the effect on output can be fairly catastrophic, so it is convex. Okay. So we start, I think, in many of, these in many of the mechanisms I'm going to talk about, we start with these two curves. Now, what this says is if you have a small shock, so say for some reason you have more bankruptcies at a given level of output because there's a housing burst or something like this, right? the effect on output is going to be very small and multiplier is going to be small. Okay. If the shock is larger, or you start from a position which was already not great, then the effect of the same shift is going to be stronger, because of the slope here is stronger, is stronger than here. So the more, basically, the bigger the shock, the stronger the multiplier, and or the worse the initial position, uh, the, w the, the bigger the multiplier. Uh, and then at some stage, you can see that what happens is that we shift to uh, the, 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 the graph on, on the right, which is that at some stage, these two start crossing again. So if things are really very bad, not only do you get 
if you stay with the same equilibrium, you go from D to D prime, and you get a fairly strong multiplier. But there is now the possibility, when you shift from the, uh, the thick line to the thin line, that there is another equilibrium, D double prime. And I think much of what we see depends on you know how big the shock is, the initial position, and so on. So with this in mind, let me move on. So the five steps. It's going to be absolutely familiar to all of you. I'm going to start with some adverse shock to some asset price, say a decrease in housing, which was the case in, in the US, uh, Spain, Ireland. Okay. Level one is uh, that there is an effect on the balance sheets of the bars, so they have worse balance sheet. Uh, collateral they have is lower valued, therefore they borrow less. Uh, if they borrow less, then there is less spending, there is lower output, and this makes the, the balance sheet worse, and so you get the two-way relation. But in this case, uh, the multipliers are, are fairly moderate. In, in normal times, you have these two-way interactions, it's not the end of the world. Depends on initial leverage. If it's not too bad, then the effect is very small. And that's what we, we saw with the high-tech bubble burst, which is there was not much leverage for the people involved, not much effect on the economy. And that's easy to integrate in standard models. And so this predates uh, the, the crisis. It was done. It gives an amplification mechanism. But we thought, OK, that's one more. No big deal. The second step is the same thing, but on the lender's side. And again, all this is totally familiar, which is that as a result of a shock, they have worse balance sheet, they have lower capital, therefore they cut lending. Lower lending leads to less spending, lower output, worse balance sheet, and then you get uh, a similar effect as before, except that what you get is that the multipliers are now much stronger because of the leverage of the financial intermediaries is substantially higher than that of the borrower. So you start getting fairly big effects, you get multipliers. Uh, it's still, I mean, as long as the amplification mechanism is not too strong, it's just more amplification, but not, not the end of the world. And, and again, I mean, the, the example there is that we saw, the effect of housing, US, Spain, Ireland, and then what uh, Ben mentioned, which is the effect on German banks, which were holding uh, claims on, on US uh, uh, subprimes. Okay. So one and two, I would not call mundane, but tractable. Then what we talked about a lot yesterday, which is when basically there is an effect on the liability side of the financial intermediaries, which are the, the runs, the sudden stops, the role of a crisis, the interbank market freeze. And we know that that can happen on its own, but typically it doesn't happen on its own. There's some doubt about solvency, and there's, I think, a lot of nitrogen uncertainty at play. And you saw people worried about solvency basically run out, and this creates a liquidity crisis. And then we know the effect, which is there's a run on liabilities, fire sales, less lending, less lending leads to less spending, lower output, worse balance sheet. And then the multipliers can become extremely large. And then we get into the region of multiple equilibria at some point. Uh, and then it becomes uh, a much more serious thing. So what determines whether we get to that level, uh, the number of institutions that were actually discussed yesterday, uh, the role of a lender of last resort is clearly very important. And there, there is a big difference that Barry emphasizes in his, in his book about the Great Depression, therefore the Great Recession, which is that in Europe, the role of lender of last resort was really not used uh, because the banks thought that they could not use it and that made an enormous difference. And then the implicit guarantees, deposit insurance and so on, which basically determines whether this happens. So these are the three levels that, that Ben focuses on uh, in his presentation. Uh, in fact, I think there are two more levels, although I think for the US you could stop there. But for uh, Europe, and in general, I think then you get uh, two more levels, maybe 4A and 4B rather than 4 and 5, but that's a semantic issue. Okay. So then you get the interaction between the state and the financial institutions. And again, we've, uh, we've been fairly creative in using words. Uh, doom loops, diabolical loops, deadly embrace, right? And the idea is that the weak uh, balance sheets of the banks increase the probability of the bailouts. The probability of bailouts leads to dangers on the to a public balance sheet, and the public uh, balance sheet leads uh, to making bailouts uh, less likely. And then you get this two-way interaction, and it can be bad. And uh, there is 
a related aspect, which is interacting, but is conceptually independent, which is you can have fiscal multiple equilibria, which is, you know, a country is able to borrow at a lower rate, but then everybody believes that maybe it's not going to continue, and they ask for a large spread, and then that makes it impossible. It typically interacts with this uh, in, in, in a complex way, but these mechanisms are at work. Then you really get strong multipliers, and you get multiple equilibria, and again, uh, we have plenty of examples of, uh, of, of a crisis in Europe doing that. Thank you. Okay, so how does this depend on, on and how likely is this outcome? It depends on the fiscal position. Uh, it depends on the resolution process uh, if banks uh, are in trouble. It depends on the interaction, which is the amount of bonds in the bank's balance sheets, which is a very hot issue at this stage uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, it did not happen in the Great Depression. That, that loop because the bailouts were unlikely and nobody thought the state was actually going to just do it on a large scale. So as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think that there was this fiscal interaction. It did not happen in the US because the fiscal position of the US was seen as very strong, so they could do it. Uh, but it clearly has played a major role uh, in, the, in the Euro uh, Great Recession. So that has been there. And then the last level, is the role of the exchange rate regime. Uh, so basically there is no, any, either way you get complications and you get these interactions. If you have flexible rates, then we know that in principle it can help, I and mean, the depreciation may help push uh, at least foreign demand. So you get usual positive effect, not on domestic demand, sorry, on, 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 on foreign demand therefore. But you get, uh, what we've learned is that in some contexts you basically get the balance sheet effect, uh, which goes the other way, which is that if your liabilities are in foreign currency, uh, then you get in trouble and then you get some of the same mechanisms we saw earlier. If you have fixed rates, I mean this is the difference between, so this, this is your dollar this time, fixed rates is the gold standard, uh, then Again, it doesn't work great. You get limited room to decrease interest rates, so you can't use it. Uh, you clearly can't decrease the, uh, you can't have a, a devaluation or a depreciation. Uh, you have a potential constraint on lender of last resort, although I think this is not intrinsic to fixed rates. You could have fixed rates and lender of last resort, but again, Barry makes uh, an important point here that this was important in the, in the Great Depression. And then when people start thinking that you're not going to be able to do it, then you get uh, redetermination risk of a risk of devaluation, and then again the scope for multiple equilibria, uh, which you know we're now thinking about again because of Italy, uh, means that uh, again we can have very very large effects. So how relevant was all this for these def different episodes? Well, irrelevant for the U.S. Great de Recession, and uh, as we know, uh, when things really went bad in the U.S., money actually came back to the U.S. because it was seen as a safe haven, which was a bit paradoxical, but uh, uh, you know, eliminated this problem for the U.S. Uh, very relevant for the non-U.S. Uh, Great Depression, two minutes, and then highly relevant for the uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Italy in the Great Recession. So I think these are the five steps. They don't always come. Uh, financial crisis we saw yesterday are a combination of all these things, and sometimes you know some some are there and some are not. In terms of policy, once you think uh, about it this way, then basically the idea is you want to decrease the probability that this happens, and then so you want to basically announce measures which you'll take ex post to basically make things less bad, and then measures ex ante to decrease the probability. And if I had more time, I would go for each of these. Uh, and then the last point I want to make is that, you know, can we integrate this in DSG models? And as long as it's multipliers which are not too large, yes. As soon as we get into the multiple equilibria part of the, of, of the space, then it's much harder to do, and I'm not sure that uh, we have done it or we'll, d we'll do it very easily. Given the time, what I was going to do was actually to look at the numbers from Ben and show how uh, the, the you could basically using his graph tell the story, but he has done it well and I don't have time, so I'm going to stop here.